Today we are continuing in our series on the book of Ecclesiastes. This series is called Meaningful. It's about how to live a meaningful life, even in the midst of this broken world. And it is my first time sharing during this series, and I'm so honored and excited to do so. We've been talking about themes like work and pleasure and wealth and so many things, embracing the seasons of life. And last week, John spoke about, who can tell me? Contentment. Last week, John spoke about contentment, being content. Now, he said it's different to be content and to be satisfied, okay? Satisfied, wanting more from this life, wanting to see all that God can do, that's a good thing. But we must live content, enjoying the lives that God has given us. He gave us three ways to do this. The first was to practice gratitude, the second was to trust God. Now, friends, we talk about trusting God all the time. But actually trusting God is a different thing, isn't it? The last thing he talked about was adjusting our attitude. I don't know about you, but I took that challenge very personally. I said, Lord, help me with this challenge. Do you remember what it was? Refuse to complain. That was our challenge last week, was to refuse to complain. Did anyone else take that as a personal challenge last week? Yes, thank you, so many. I caught myself last week multiple times starting to complain, and then went, oh, 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 oh nope, 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 I'm not going to do it. More than myself, because it's hard to see it in ourselves, I caught this guy right here. I'm telling you, it is a bad thing to be married when you're the one that preaches regularly. Because your wife hears it three times on Sunday. And she's going to say, oh, Pastor John, didn't you tell us not to complain this week? And he goes, yeah, about that. <laughs> but I thought this question so many times. I asked myself so many times this week, what if I actually lived like this? What if we actually lived that way? What if we actually refused to complain? What if we actually practiced gratitude? Practice, that's the key word. Practice, get better at gratitude. It was an amazing message. I hope that you listen online or through the app if you were not here last Sunday. Today we're gonna continue through the book of Ecclesiastes and Solomon is going to speak to us inspired by the Holy Spirit about wisdom itself. He's going to draw a contrast between the wise and the fools. How many of you in here like me recognize that you sometimes have a little fool in you? Anybody? Yeah, if your hand isn't up, then maybe you have a little fool in you, okay? We, we recognize that, that we need to grow in wisdom. And that is the big idea today. The big idea we're going to talk about today is that we can all grow in wisdom, but it is our choice. It will not happen on its own. It will not magically appear in our lives over the years. No, 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 no. We can all grow in wisdom, but it is our choice. We're gonna talk about character, sorrow, and perspective as we grow in wisdom. So let's bow our heads, let's pray, and let's ask the Lord to reveal himself. Father, our ears are open, our hearts are open. We need you today. We recognize that on our own, we are fools more often than we would like to admit. We recognize our need for your wisdom taking root in our lives. So do that through your word today. We are ready to listen. We are ready to obey. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. As you open your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 7, I have a question for you today. How many of you like to smell good? How many of you like to smell good? Yes, it is summer in Barcelona, guys. This is very important. Very, all the smells. I mean, like all the smells, right? It's just kind of a thing. I'm not into fancy perfume, although my friend who happens to be here just gave me perfume about two weeks ago, and I've worn it three or four times. But I'm not super into fancy perfumes and, and good smells. But I will say this. I am super against bad smells like super duper extremely against bad smells. John and I have gum on us or near us at all times. 
I, I carry deodorant and dental floss in my purse. I am super committed to not smelling bad. Some of you might want to consider that commitment yourselves, okay? You might, I'm totally joking. It's summer in Barcelona. Lighten up, okay? But I do want to say this. We like to smell good. A few years ago, 13 years ago to be exact, John and I had been married for just a short while, and he went out to dinner with his parents who were visiting us in Florida. I could not join that night. I had fallen asleep already. He comes home around two o'clock in the morning, and the smell was so bad, it literally woke me up from my sleep. If you know me, that is hard to do. So I said, what is that smell? He goes, I don't know. Go back to sleep. I said, I don't think I can. Like, that smell is bad. What? I wasn't pregnant, guys. This was just that bad, okay? And so literally, I didn't, I could not sleep for a while. The next morning, I get up. It's a Sunday morning. We're getting ready for church, a wonderful church we were part of in Florida. And I said to John, there is a cloud in our house, and it smells bad. And he goes, maybe it's you. I was like, maybe it is. So I'm like smelling myself. I don't smell. I said, John, breathe on me. These are things that you do with your spouse occasionally. You say, breathe. And he goes, oh. I went, oh. And I said, John, unfortunately, it's not just in your mouth. I can smell it on your arms. I can smell it on your hands. I can smell it on your neck. It was, mm. I said, what did you eat last night? He said, Brandy, I just ate Tuscan chicken. I said, what's in Tuscan chicken? He said, well, there's tomatoes and cheese and chicken and some spinach. I said, nope, there's something else in there. He said, maybe some garlic. I said, oh, yeah, that's it right there. And this Mediterranean boy right here, when he eats large amounts of garlic, it doesn't stay here. It seeps through his pores. I'm actually not joking, and I traumatized him through that event because I could not keep my mouth shut. We go to church, and I literally said to everyone around us, I'm so sorry John smells today. I know John smells today. He ate a lot of garlic. Stay away from the Tuscan chicken. It's a real problem. You really need to watch it. I'm so sorry my husband smells today because I wanted to help him. I didn't want him to be the guy that smells who doesn't think he smells. I thought it's better to be the person who knows it and it owns up to it. And so he took a couple of extra showers, still smelled, and to this day will not eat anything with visible garlic on it. Poor thing, I traumatized him. But this is what Solomon talks about as we open up chapter seven of Ecclesiastes. He says that a good name is better than fine perfume. He echoes this in Proverbs, which he also wrote, chapter 22, verse 1. A good name is more desirable than great riches. This is the first thing we're going to talk about uh, today as we grow in wisdom is our character. He opens up talking about a smell, the smell of a good name. Now, Solomon knew about fine perfume. Oil was a sign of wealth. It was a sign of prestige. But let's apply this to our own lives now. Maybe oils and, 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 and fancy perfumes aren't your thing. But think about all the things that we do to be a bit more attractive. Think of all the things. We go to the gym. And by we go to the gym, I mean you go to the gym. Because <laughs> I've not been in a very long time. We curl our hair, which is completely pointless with the humidity outside, right? I mean, it's completely pointless, but we do it anyway. You work on your tan. Again, you work on your tan. If I could, I would, but I can't, so I don't. But we do all these things. We buy nice clothes. We do all these things for the exterior of our body. And what Solomon is saying, and the Lord is using him to say, is who cares about all of that, if when your name is mentioned, everyone rolls their eyes. Who cares about everything being right on the outside if the inside is so rotten that no one wants to be around you? We all know people like this. We had an encounter this last week. I know it sounds awful to admit it, but this person's character is so rotten. We ran into them in a restaurant, and literally, John and I both greeted them and went back to our seat and said, oh, wow, oh. And I thought that's exactly what Solomon is talking about. 
That's exactly what he's talking about. We can fix everything on the outside, but what matters and what is valued is our character from the inside. Think about it. Think about someone who you admire, who might be 10, 20, 30 years older than you. Think of someone who you admire and what you admire about them. Now, I'm not going to lie. I am very capable of admiring physical things. You probably are too. I'm very capable of noticing and appreciating physical things. But I tell you what, you know what I'm learning to admire? I am learning to appreciate when someone actually says something that was deep, like they had something to say. Like life had taught them a couple things and they wanted to pour it into me. They had something to say. I'm a mom and I am learning to admire when children grow up and still want to be around their parents. That's like a hashtag life goal for me is that my children would grow up and still want to be around me. You know what I mean? These are things that I am learning to admire. What about people who, who are so generous with what God has given them? They don't control their money or their possessions with a tight fist. They're open-handed. They know that they are stewards. What about people who could brag? They really could boast, but for whatever reason, they choose not to. What about those who have kept fighting for a marriage or for a family when they could have left, but they didn't? They stuck it out. Or those whose brains have been kicked in in business or through a friendship or a relationship, and they still see beauty in life. These are things that we admire, people who don't just talk about the Bible, but who live by the word of God. Solomon says, watch your character. It matters. Stop looking the part and be the part. Stop looking the way you want to look or be perceived and actually become those things on the inside out. Become who you want to be. Watch your character. What is the Lord working on in you? What is the Lord working on in you? All of us deal with this. If you're a youth or a young adult here, or maybe a new believer, maybe there's a set of basic character issues that the Holy Spirit is like, boom, 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 and he's been working on. Now, I'm not saying this doesn't apply to all of us. God knows these things apply to all of us. But some basic character issues to nail down would be some of these. What about telling the truth? Telling the truth. I'm going to tell you, people will not take you seriously if you lie. It, amen. I mean, it's just the truth. Basic character qualities. I know this firsthand. When I was in my early 20s, I struggled and still struggle because I talk a lot and I have a bad memory. So I would begin to tell stories and examples and blah, blah, blah. And then I would realize, I don't know where I'm going with this, but I'm going so fast and I don't really know how this ends, and I would just kind of fill in the details, right? And, and John would tell me, he loves me. He told me, I, this was maybe a decade ago, he said, Bran, I love you, but your mouth is a problem. <laughs> Ladies, take note. Gentlemen, take note. You need someone in your life. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Okay, but he said, Brandy, your mouth is a problem. I said, no, it's not. He said, yes, it is, and he has a very good memory, and he came up with four or five or six or 20 times when I had recently extorted and not told the truth. I was horrified because I didn't want to be that person, and I said, Holy Spirit, help me, and I will tell you now, you will hear me telling a story, and I'll say, so last Thursday, and then I'll say, nope, I don't think it was Thursday. I think it was Tuesday, and the person listening is going, Bran, who cares? It doesn't matter if it was Thursday or Tuesday. It doesn't matter to them, but it matters to me because it's my character that's being developed. It's my character that's being worked on. It's my wisdom that is growing. What about work ethic? What about actually doing what you say you're going to do? People will not take you seriously if you're lazy. I'm telling you, you will be the one that people are rolling their eyes about because they don't think you're going to finish what you start, okay? What about some things like budgeting, living in your means, basic character? You say, that's not in the Bible. Oh, yes, it is. The Bible says to be faithful with what is little so that he can then give you much. 
What about just like daily responsibility? Listen, a guy who goes to this church, and I love him, went away for three months, and he came back. And I said, how was your time away? He said, Brandy, it was shocking. I said, oh my, what was shocking about it? He said, Brandy, dishes don't wash themselves. <laughs> what? Wow. Right? He says, clothes don't wash themselves. Toilets don't clean themselves. Brandy, it was shocking to me how much had been done for me. And when I had to handle my own life, he said, it blew my mind. To which I say, welcome to life, my friend. <laughs> welcome to my everyday life, my friend. But this is part of our character being developed. What about running your race and not comparing to everyone on the right or on the left? Not being dissatisfied and frustrated all the time, but running your race, the race marked out for you. These are obvious things, but as you grow, as you develop, as you mature, the character issues get a little more difficult to spot. What about handling conflict? The Bible says very clearly, do everything you can do to be at peace with everyone. What about bitterness and offense? Hebrews said it clearly just a few weeks ago. Do not let a root of bitterness take, well, take root in your heart. Do not let bitterness take root in your heart, right? I'm telling you, the older you get, the more opportunity you will have to be offended and bitter every day of your life. But you don't have to be, but it's a choice. Because we can all grow in wisdom, but wisdom is a choice. What about your mouth? What about watching your mouth? Gossip is literally right next to murder in multiple scriptures. But for some reason, we think it's okay. We think it's okay, and you find yourself talking ill of others or telling someone else's news or slander and character assassination, poison flying out of your mouth. And we say, oh, God, please forgive me. I hope it doesn't hurt anyone. How about as we develop the character of Christ in our hearts and in our lives, we grow in wisdom and we actually set a guard on our mouth? Are you guys with me? Yeah? Yeah? Like, this is really good stuff. I'm not joking. This is good stuff. If you do it, it can change everything. You talk to older people about their character. You say, you've been a Christian for years. What do you deal with? And I've heard multiple times, Brandy, I don't want to become rigid. I don't want to become dogmatic. I want to stay teachable. I'm struggling with living in the past. This chapter actually talks about that. Don't say of the former days, they were better than these, because that is foolish. But this is character development in the heart and soul of every follower of Christ. As we grow in wisdom, our character matters. If you want to grow in these things, like if you want to become more wise, quick tip for you today, seek out the wise Seek out someone who's wiser than you. If you want to be more wise, do not follow the fruit of someone's lips because that's not where it's at. Anyone can talk good, okay? Follow the fruit of their lives. Are they actually at peace with others? Are they actually concerned with their own soul? Are they concerned about your soul? Is money controlling them? Is that basing their decisions? Or are they generous stewards of what God has given them? Are they grateful? Do they tend to complain? Do they speak will, sorry, well of those around them? Or do they easily and quickly sell somebody else out? What kind of person are they? Ask questions. And when this wise person talks, listen, listen. We can all grow in wisdom, but it is our choice. Character matters. As we grow in wisdom, the second thing that Solomon is going to address under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is our sorrow and our lament. Woo! Let's talk about some sorrows, right? Isn't that why you came to church? Listen, we don't want to talk about this stuff, but it is real, and it's a real part of life, and it is a very real part of character development and growing in wisdom. The Bible has a whole book 
called Lamentations. A huge chunk of the Psalms are called the Psalms of Lament. Jesus mourned over Jerusalem. Jesus lamented when his friend died. It's all throughout Scripture. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. I'm going to just read some fragments. The day of death is better than the day of birth. A house of mourning is better than a house of feasting. Frustration is better than laughter. A sad face is sometimes good for the heart. Actually, it doesn't say sometimes. I put that in there because it sounds a little softer. It says, a sad face is good for the heart. See my commitment to honesty? (laughs) It's true. Verse four, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. Thanks, Solomon. So if I want to be wise, I have to be sad all the time? Is that what you're telling me? He's saying we should like funerals more than parties. We went to two really great parties this last week. Two couples who we love so much got married this weekend, and it was so much fun. But you know what Solomon is saying? He's saying you don't learn near as much at a party as you learn at a funeral. He's saying when you go to a funeral, and some of you know very well what I'm talking about, it causes you to reflect on your own life. When you go to a funeral, you have an opportunity to grow. Why? Because you do the deep soul work of who you are and why you're on this planet. He says a sad face can be good for the heart. You know, we like to celebrate our good days publicly, don't we? But our sad days, we don't really want anybody to know about, okay? But I'm telling you right now, It's in those sad, hard moments that our character is being developed, most likely like no other. It's in those moments. Listen, you look at our Instagram, and you see a picture of our beautiful family, and yes, thank God, we have a beautiful family, right? And you go, wow, that's awesome. You know what you don't see? You don't see the almost 15 years, 17 together of work that we've put into our marriage. You don't see it, do you? You see big smiles, and you go, oh, that's cute. I see your vacations, and I can't see the hard work that you put into that to be able to do that for your family. I can't see that, but I know you did that because you would not be able to be on that trip without that. It's funny, even in the church, people see Instagram or Facebook pictures of our beautiful band worshiping Jesus, and people will say, oh, that's so cool how they're so blah, blah, blah. Those guys are here literally the entire weekend. They're doing cables and sound and blah, blah, and tape and all kinds of stuff. They are servants of all. But you don't always see that, do you? I'm telling you, the darkest moments of your life, that is when your character is being developed, when people don't see what's going on, when you are laying in your bed crying out to God, when you are on your knees begging him for his presence, when you are with your family and don't know what's going to happen next, These are the moments when character grows. These are the moments where you can grow in wisdom, but it is your choice how you will handle the sorrow and the lament in your life. Laments can come from lots of places. Number one, the enemy. We know that. The enemy of our souls, darkness. We don't talk about it a whole lot here at ICB. But you know, you cannot look at the scripture without recognizing it, that the forces of darkness are against the children of light. And there can be sorrow from the hand of the enemy. What do you learn? You learn to rebuke, and you learn to overcome. You put into practice the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony, and you learn that you have weapons against warfare that are mighty in God. That's what you learn when sorrow comes at the hand of the enemy. But you can't blame the enemy for everything because there are definite sorrows that come from your own stupid mistakes and my own dumb actions and our own pathetic behaviors so often bring on hardship and bring on lament. What do we do then? We repent. The Bible says in chapter, sorry, verse 5 of chapter 7, it's better to listen to the rebuke of a wise person than the praise of fools. Wise people listen to those who correct them. It says that fools have friends around them singing songs about how great they are. That's what the fools do. 
but wise people have someone who can stick their finger in their face and say, I love you and you are the problem here. Anybody? That's what a wise person will do. They will have someone in their life and they will choose to repent. Sorrows can be sent by God. Absolutely sorrows can be sent by God. Of course, we believe that he allows all these things, the permissible will of God, but they can actually be sent by God. Think of Paul. He had a thorn in his flesh. Paul, guys, he had it going on. He had the background. He had the ministry. He had the anointing. He had everything, and he was tempted to become conceited occasionally. Anybody here ever tempted to become conceited? Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to raise your hands. I know who you are. I could look at you right now and pick you out, okay? I'm one of them. We can tend to think that we're something, and God put a thorn in his flesh, and he asked God three times to take it away. Did God take it away? No. What did he say? My grace is sufficient for you, but he didn't take the thorn away, and maybe you're here today, and the enemy is after you rebuke him. Maybe you're making some stupid mistakes. Repent. Maybe God's allowing a circumstance in your life, and it would say here in verse 14 that when times are good, be happy. But when times are bad, consider this. God has made one as well as the other. Good times are a gift, but bad times can also be a gift. Sorrow is an opportunity for us to grow. Last but not least, he talks about character, he talks about sorrow, and there's so many other things in this chapter for you to read. So read it on your own. But the final thing I want to share with you today is that as we grow in character, as we frame our sorrows, we must develop our perspective. Perspective, and this is where we're gonna end today. As I mentioned, Ecclesiastes is one of the five wisdom books of the Old Testament. Do you know what they are? They are Job, they are Psalms, they are Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs. Three of these were written by Solomon. Proverbs, how to be successful in life. Psalms, the writings of David. Love David. He's like, God, you're awesome. God, where are you? I get David, don't you? <laughs> I get David. Then there's Song of Songs. Let's just say this is a series we probably won't teach on a Sunday morning. Fact, Hebrew young boys could not read this book until they were of age, okay, because of the provocative and sexual nature of the book of Song of Solomons. But then there's Job and Ecclesiastes, and these books actually teach the exact same lesson, but from two different perspectives. The exact same lesson but from two different perspectives because one of them loses it all and the other one has it all. Let's talk about Job, flocks, servants, camels, loses it all, sheep, children, his own health, loses it all. All His wife becomes bitter. He hits his knees. He begins to worship God. And he says, God gives and God takes away. He knew. He knew that his confidence could not be placed on the things of this earth. He knew that his hope was not found on this terrestrial ball. He knew it. And then you have Solomon, the teacher, ruling from Jerusalem king of prosperous and wealthy Jerusalem and Israel, having more wealth and fame and power than we will ever, let's be honest, than we will ever, ever have. And in his old age, he hasn't lost it all. He's not like Job. He has it all. And he says on repeat, it is all meaningless. Not some things. He says everything is meaningless. Look it up for yourself. The word heaven is used 38 times in 12 chapters. Meaningless. We tend to think that if we were Solomon, not Job, that it would be different. That if we had all that our hearts desired, that somehow life would be more meaningful. Listen to this very short quote by Jim Carrey. Do you know who Jim Carrey is? Comedian? Yeah, it just makes me laugh thinking about him. He said, I think everybody should get rich and famous. 
and do everything they ever dreamed of so that they can see that it's really not the answer. I'm gonna read it again, it's good. I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it's really not the answer. What's he saying? It's all meaningless under the sun. It's all meaningless under the sun. Solomon, at the end of his life, concludes, something is missing, something is off, something is broken, something isn't working. There is a void inside his heart that could not be filled. He was crying out from the innermost part of his soul, there must be more, and there was. He was sitting on the very throne of the line of David, which is where the one who could heal brokenness, who could heal emptiness, would one day sit. He was sitting 27 generations before Yeshua himself, the Messiah who would take away the sins of the world. There was more, but it couldn't be found under the sun. And here's the trick of the entire book of Ecclesiastes. As followers of Jesus, we are not living for what is under the sun. We're living for what is beyond the sun, friends. I love you, but if your life and your confidence and your treasure is found on what you can amass for yourself or on what this world has to answer, you, like Solomon, will say it is meaningless. But when our trust is transferred to Christ, we have full life here on earth, but full life abundantly. Our perspective completely changes. So here's my question. Are you living only for what's under the sun. If life seems and feels meaningless, you probably are. Here's my encouragement. Root yourself on something stronger than you. Establish yourself on a rock that is stronger than yourself. Live and dream and plan, not just for what is under the sun, but for what goes beyond the sun. Eternal impact, lives changed, souls forever committed to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Yes, work and toil and vacation and enjoy. Yes, yes, but don't do it for the end goal of what can be found under the sun. Because friends, our lives are committed and will be rewarded by what is beyond the sun. Bow your heads this morning. Father, we recognize that we can all grow in wisdom, but it's our choice. I pray that you would help us to examine our character. Help us to see sorrow the way that you see it. Help us, King Jesus, to adjust our perspective to what you might be doing through our lives that cannot be accomplished just under the sun, but that our lives will be about far more than we can see, feel, perceive, or even touch. That we would have a sense of value beyond what this sun can offer us. We worship you in this place in Jesus' name. ask if you would still in a posture of prayer to have your heads bowed and your eyes closed in just a moment we're going to go into a time of reflection and prayer and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us but before we do we always want to make sure that we create space to ask this question maybe you're here this morning and you would say John you know what I'm not a follower of Jesus Christ Maybe you're here this morning and you've never made the decision to place your confidence and your trust in Him. But maybe you're here and at some point throughout our gathering today or when Brandy was speaking, you just sense something in your heart and in your soul. And maybe you're here this morning and you say, John, I want to ask Jesus into my heart. I want forgiveness of my sins. I want peace and hope and a life that's worth living. If that's you, I want to pray with you. Or maybe you're here today and you would say, you know what, John? I used to be a follower of Jesus. I used to follow strong in his way, but it's been a really long time since I actually lived for him. And maybe you're here this morning and you would say, I could really use a fresh start. If that's you, I wanna pray with you as well. Every head bowed, every eye closed. 
If you're here this morning, you say, John, I want to ask Jesus into my heart, or John, I need a fresh start today. Would you just raise your hand right where you are so I can pray with you? I need a fresh start. Yeah, I see you. I want Jesus in my heart. Yeah, I see you. I need a fresh start. My eyes have been on this world too much, the things under the sun. I need a redo. Yeah, I see you. I need Jesus in my heart. Anyone else? Hand up and right back down where you are. Come on. I need a fresh start today. Yeah. Okay. Let's do this. To support our friends that raise their hands, let's pray this prayer together. Lord Jesus, I need you. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of the past. Come into my heart. I accept you as the Son of God. Give me a fresh start. Give me hope and a bright future. Life here and eternal. And the Bible says if you ask him to come in that he does. It says that he gives you a fresh start. It says the old has gone and the new has come and you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. So if you raised your hand, you prayed that this morning, congratulations, welcome home. At the end of our gathering, we have a next step table there in the back. We would love to meet you there, give you a Bible, chat with you, pray with you, give you some information on how you can go deeper in this journey that you've begun today in discipleship and in growing in the way that Christ is leading you into. I'm proud of you. Now for just the next few moments, right where you are, I wanna spend a time in prayer and reflection. I want you to posture your heart wide open, let the Holy Spirit speak questions this morning are simply these. What areas of your character needs to grow? What area of your character needs to grow? And are you living only for what is under the sun? Let the Holy Spirit speak to you for a moment. I'll come back and close.